God, we love you and we thank you so much for this day. It is a gift. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to help us, Lord, to steward this gift well um, as we endeavor to make a difference in the lives of the students you have placed into our care. Uh, we just ask that in this time of Devo that you would encourage our hearts and our spirits uh, and Lord, make us a little stronger and a little faster in this race you've called us to. We love you and we thank you for it in your name. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, uh, talking about qualities of leadership. And then next week and the week after, we're going to get into some leadership examples from uh, both Peter and Paul from, from Scripture. Uh, and I think that uh, for me, it's one of the most interesting parts of this, of this study is looking at these great men of God and just seeing how uh, the Lord used them in their differing leadership styles uh, in the work that he called them to. So last week, if you will, if you will remember, which I'm sure all of you do, um, right, all of, without a doubt, remember every point of every CEU I've ever done, especially last week's. Uh, you'll remember we talked about uh, the character uh, of a leader uh, the competence of a leader, the charisma of a leader, and we learned, uh, Clarissa told me that every person is a piece of metal in some way, right? No? That's not it? No. No. Uh, so every person is a tan, right? A tan, not, not a tin, right, in, in some way. Uh, you have to forgive me, I'm from the South, so if I confused you with that last week, I was not calling you or your students a piece of metal or a Coke can, right? Uh, tin and tan are interchangeable where I'm from, all right? Same for you, Rachel? It's, it's okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if I confused you, I apologize. Uh, I've, I've never been known for my great linguistic abilities, so... Uh, but today we're picking up uh, on, on number four, um, and I think that is filled in for you with that of commitment. And these are a combination of J. Oswald Sanders from Spiritual uh, Leadership and uh, John Maxwell's uh, qualities of, of a leader as well. Uh, so, so commitment, something that if you're around BICE for any length of time, you realize that there is a whole lot of. Uh, this crew here is deeply committed, I feel, to the mission that God has, has given us to invest in these students and in this, in this community. Um, I think as uh, Mr., Mr. Thomas shared with us, um, I believe it was an article from Lydia at the home office uh, a few, maybe a couple of months ago, about the third quarter. There are seasons uh, within ministry here, within life here, that uh, that commitment is perhaps put to the test and maybe is a little more difficult uh, to wake up every day and feel that strong drive or that strong passion um, with, the, with the commitment we show every day. But nevertheless, even in those seasons, it is obvious that this is a committed group of, of people. Um, but here's what we know about commitment. Uh, commitment. Commitment starts in the heart, right? It starts in that place of, of passion. Um, and it is so easy, um, it is so easy uh, to be committed to something when we start. Like the beginning of the school year, it's, it's, really, it's really easy to like have this unbelievable passion and commitment. Probably some of the most creative lessons that come are like, like in those first few weeks of school, right? Because you've got this resolve like, this is the year I'm going to be the best teacher ever, right? We find that in the beginning of a, of a new year with like uh, New Year's resolutions or goals. You, you go down to Boomi uh, the first week of January and you can't find a parking place. You can't find a treadmill to get on because it is so packed. Why? Because that first week of January, people have resolved in their heart that this is the year, right? And they are committed to their health, 
right? And so, I mean, in that first week, it is, it is easy uh, to get in there and, and to do. But then life sort of happens, right? And one day it's so much going on that you're not able to make it to the gym. Uh, or one week is just so overwhelming that you're not able to put the creativity into the lessons that maybe you did in the weeks before. And then one day leads to another and to another, and before you know it, like your boomy card is expiring and you realize, I've only been to the gym three times in the last year. I don't think I quite, um, I, I quite paid for that uh, membership this year. Right, so, so commitment starts in the heart, uh, but it's tested by our action. It's tested by our action, and I think we could even go one step fur- further with that and say it's tested by our actions over time. Uh, it's really not how we start, because it's easy to start with that great sense of commitment and passion and resolve, but that action day after day after day uh, is where is where that commitment is really put to the test. Um, again, I think this is an incredibly committed group uh, of people, and it inspires me every day being around uh, you guys. Uh, again, guys is one of those interchangeable words where I'm from. That's you ladies, guys and gals. Um, it's, it, is, uh, it is inspiring being around, being around you and uh, seeing your commitment that in this, in this season of life has no doubt been tested. Um, and I know, I know that there are days when it just, you feel weary. But man, when I look, when I look at you guys, I think that commitment has been tested and you guys have passed the test. So great, great job. Uh, fifth in the qualities of essential to leadership is, is communication. Um, we, know, we know that in your, in your classes, you are the communicator in chief, right? Um, in any leadership role, communication uh, with those that we are leading, whether it's with your children at home whether it's with your students in class or with your team that you might, you might lead, uh, communication is essential. Um, and John Maxwell actually gives some, some great principles on, on communication that I think are really, uh, really important reminders uh, to us of, of how to communicate effectively. Um, he says, first of all, simplify your message. Um, and I, I think, I think so many times of myself when I was, when I was preparing this, I think, man, sometimes I am so good at overcomplicating things. Um, it's one thing I appreciate about, about Ikea and getting, getting furniture from, uh, Ikea, or as I learned yesterday, how do we say, I- Ikea, Ikea, is that right? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty much fluent in Indonesia, as you can tell. Uh, so, like, I, I hate when the times that we've gone to IKEA and get, get a bunch of furniture, then come home and realize, oh, crud, I've got to put it together. But I do always appreciate the fact that uh, their instructions are pretty well put together. They communicate with you very well that if you follow those instructions, you're going to be okay. Uh, as opposed to this other place in town, I believe it was um, Informa maybe, where we got a piece of furniture, or care for. We got a piece of furniture, and it was, looked like a pretty simple, simple thing when it was on display. When we get the instructions... Uh, I mean, for this little piece of furniture, like, the instructions were so complicated. And, and I'm thinking, like, I'm just looking at it, and I'm like, my mind is, like, blown right now. Like, i got to take a step away before I start this process, because it is, just, it is just too much. And I think, you know, even if it's a complex piece of furniture, I appreciate the simple instructions and the pictures that Ikea gives you in, in putting things 
together. I think our communication is, is the same way. Uh, if we're not careful, sometimes we can uh, make things over complex by giving too many details to people that really don't need all of those details. Simplify the message uh, and it makes, it makes communication more effective. And seeing the person uh, realizing that it's just not the message that we're presenting, but it's the person that's in front of us that really matters more than the message that, that, that we're trying to convey to them, right? So we want for them to be able to, to comprehend what we are saying. And sometimes when we, when we do that, it means that we have to talk to, talk to them in a way that they can understand. Uh, I'm, I'm good at sometimes, especially with like Tyra, trying to communicate to her in a way that I can understand. And she has to remind me many times, I, I need you to speak in a language I can understand because I think differently from you. When I was pastoring a church, I remember sitting in a conference with, I think it was Andy Stanley, uh, who Jeremy referenced the other day, and, and he, he said, when you're preaching, look out into your audience, and, and he said, for me, he said, I'm always thinking of, I think it was three or four different people, I'm thinking of the single mother uh, that, that is in our audience that is working two jobs and has all of these kids that she's brought to church that morning and probably there in sort of a frazzled state, but this is the first time that she's been in a non-work or a non-mothering environment. So I, wanna, I want to be able to relay my message in a way that relates to her. I want to be able to, to speak my message in a way that relates to a young 20-something single that, uh, uh, that, is, that is not married, just freshly in the workforce, and to that person that, that might be a little older and seasoned in life. And uh, so I'm thinking, you've got multiple kinds of people in the audience that you're trying to convey this same message to uh, with different kinds of personalities. How do you speak in a way that communicates to those people? Uh, because the way they hear is different than the way we as the communicator might hear. So we've got to see them and relate our message to them. And I think with students, it's the same, right? They're all the same age, the people in our class, but they're so different, right? And we, we can't always have a cookie-cutter approach to every student. Every student might hear in a different way, might receive in a different way, and it's our job as a leader to communicate to them in a way uh, that they can understand. Um, uh, third, show the truth. And then, and then fourth, seek a response. And I think these, these were certainly uh, shared in the context of communicating in terms of, of preaching, but I think the same is true in any communication uh, platform that, that truth is presented when we communicate uh, and, and trying to get a response from those that we're communicating to is important. Uh, the sixth quality of essential to leadership uh, is that of courage. Uh, and I love, I love this quote that one person with courage is a majority. And we certainly see that with uh, great leaders throughout the course of history that had to make a stand uh, with, with great courage. Uh, right now in elementary chapel, we're talking about Daniel, uh, who when you look at his life, so many of the stands that him and the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made were pretty much done uh, when everyone else was going in a different way. But they, they proved that one person with courage uh, is truly a, a majority. Uh, so as leaders, when we approach decision-making, um, many times it takes great courage to make the right decisions um, for, those, for those that we're leading. And, and I think all of us have probably been in places where we've, we've had to make difficult decisions and we wrestle with it. Uh, I told you about Pastor Lofton, a man I worked with who had this, this unbelievable ability to make the tough decisions and not to look back. I mean, he would make the decision and just move forward. 
Uh, but many of you know what it's like to like lose sleep when you're wrestling with the idea of making a decision. And then after you make the decision, you wrestle for several nights. You can't sleep at night thinking or overthinking about that decision you made because it was so, so difficult. And that, that's one of the natures of leading people. Um, like leadership is about making the tough call sometimes. It's not always, not always easy. Uh, in fact, courage begins with that inward battle, right? Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've been going down the road in a, in a car and I'm having this conversation and all of a sudden Tyra looks at me like, who are you talking to? Well, I'm talking to that person I got to have a conversation with tomorrow, right? I'm having this conversation like, and, and most, uh, it's, it's sort of like this inward battle of, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get the words just right. And, and how many of you have ever done that? Like, and, and most of the time, all of those words that you're practicing, they never get brought up, right? But there's this inward battle. You struggle with it. You grapple with it. Um, and I think it's important uh, that, that we have those, those inward battles. But courage, um, courage is having those tough conversations. It's making those, those tough decisions. And I love this thought by J. Oswald Sanders. He said, courage is making things right, not just smoothing things over. I think there's this tendency sometimes, like when things are awry, that we just want to, what will it take just to smooth this over? That's, that's not courage and that's not leadership. Like, we just don't want to smooth it over. What do we need to do to make it right? Like, what do we need to do to make this situ- situation right? Um, does someone need to apologize? Does someone need to, do we need to change course? Do we need to call someone out? Do we need to show some tough love? What needs to happen to make this right? Because that's the nature of leadership and it takes courage to do those things. Sometimes it's admitting you're wrong, which isn't easy. And sometimes it's helping other people to see where maybe they've offended or hurt someone. Um, but, but courage is essential to, to leadership. Uh, the, the next quality is that of generosity. Uh, and again, I don't think we're going get, to get through all these, so we might need to pick up the last two because they're very important. Uh, next week, Thomas Jefferson said, your candle loses nothing when it lights another, right? And I, I love that thought, and I love that analogy because when you, when you think about it, it's, it's so powerful, right? Uh, a, a candle that's used to light another candle, it doesn't affect its flame at all. And I think that's what God has called us to be, not just as leaders, not just as teachers, but as followers of Christ. I believe we should be the most generous people in all the world. Like there should be a generosity that just exudes uh, from from us. Uh, I believe every person uh, possesses one of two kinds of of mindsets, right? We either have this scarcity mentality or we have this uh, mentality of generosity. And a scarcity mentality says that if I, if I give you something, it means that I've lost something. And, and I'm afraid to let something go because I don't want to lose it or I don't want to have less than I, than I started with. But a, but a mentality of generosity says, you know what, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give and I lose nothing. I lose nothing when I give uh, to someone else. I lose nothing. In fact, in, in Scripture, we see the exact opposite is true. The Bible tells us that we gain so much when we give. Uh, when we give to others, when we help others in need, Jesus says it's this, we've done it unto Him, right? Um, and, and the Bible says that uh, when, when we give, it will be given unto us. And so we really lose nothing when we invest in others, when we are generous with our time and with our treasure. We lose nothing because it comes back to us in some way. And that doesn't always look like money. Sometimes it's just the fulfillment 
of seeing others succeed can be so gratifying, right? Uh, so a generous, a generous spirit is, is so, so very, very important. Let me give you these, fill in the blanks, and we'll get out of here. Um, number one, be grateful for whatever you have. Be grateful for whatever you have. First step of generosity is just learning to be grateful for what you have. So many times we, we, spend, we spend too many resources coveting what other people have. Um, be grateful for what you have uh, because you've been blessed with that. You've been so blessed with that. So be grateful for what you have and put people first. Like put people first. Um, man. Like when we believe in people and when we invest in people, I just think that there is something that is so, so very gratifying about, about that. Uh, third, regard money or stuff as, as just a resource. Like it's not, it's not the goal in life um, to collect as much stuff or as much money as we can. It's just really a resource that God will use to, to um, help us live and enjoy life and to be a blessing to others. And I, I think the last is so important. Develop habits of giving. Uh, man, don't, don't be a hoarder. Don't walk around with a scarcity mentality. Be generous and develop habits of intentionally giving, um, whether that's in your, in your church uh, in your day-to-day -day life, in all areas, just be a giver. Be a sower into others. And, and you will find your life so enriched and so blessed. And you will find your leadership going to another level. Let's close out with a word of prayer. God, we love you and we thank you so much for your goodness in our life. You have been good to us, Lord. And uh, we just want to say thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to be... Uh, courageous in our leadership, generous in the way we live to others, committed in all that we do, Lord. And uh, Father, let us make a difference in the lives of the people that you've called us to lead. We love you and we thank you for it in your strong name. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great day.